Today we're going to look at Ephesians, and we're, of course, teaching on the sovereignty of God. And the question remains, how sovereign is our God? The statements that the Bible makes as to the power and providence of our Lord over creation, over evil and suffering, over kings and nations, and personal identity, even down to who we are as male or female, and over so many other areas, demonstrate that God is truly sovereign over all. He chooses what He wills to do and He accomplishes it. He decrees what He decrees and what He decrees transpires. He purposes and His purposes stand. He promises and He fulfills every promise. There should be no doubt at the end that the Lord reigns over all. As a king on his throne, our God reigns. But the heart of man will devise some way either to deny God's power or to blame God's power because of what goes wrong in his life. He will deny that God can do anything so he will not seek his help or he will blame God for what happens so that he does not have to obey his word and worship him. He acts like the fool saying there is no God or acts like a bitter rebel blaming God because he doesn't seem to care or doesn't line things up for him. After all, if God is good, he would do good to me by my standard and he would give me what I want. He would not let trouble into my life, and on and on it goes. But as I've said before, it isn't only the unbeliever that is troubled at times by God's sovereignty. Christians also have difficulty with this aspect of doctrine. Though they have the Holy Spirit abiding within them, and though they have been forgiven by the blood of the cross, though they have been adopted by the Father, they can still misunderstand what it means that God is sovereign. But perhaps... In no area of God's sovereignty is there more heated debate than in the area of God's sovereignty over salvation. But the debate over the sovereignty of God and salvation is much like the debate over eschatology or end times theology. Many people avoid it like the plague because it's debated for fear of stoking criticism or controversy, and they figure that it's not really important to get right anyway, so let's just leave it alone. In our postmodern times also, many Christians believe, even if I hold the right view, I don't really need everybody to agree with me. That's prideful. I want to take the humble path and let others believe as they wish. But that is the opposite of humility. If you know the truth of the gospel, do you let others perish because you don't want to push your view on them? Well, if you know the truth of any doctrine, why would you not contend for it? Our view here is that we must, as ministers of the gospel, not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. Even as Paul said to the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20, that he did not shrink from teaching, but rather preached the whole purpose of God. Acts 20, verse 27. Dear brothers and sisters, we must study the entire Bible, even controversial doctrines therein. Every major doctrine, and certainly the doctrine of salvation is major, works its way out practically in our lives. There is a man-centered approach to salvation, and there is a God-centered approach, and they are worlds apart. You are going to urge sinners to salvation in different ways completely based on those things. But it isn't just because I must teach through the Bible that I raise this issue. I must also teach doctrines that are having effect in our church in some way. And this doctrine of the salvation The sovereignty of God in salvation has had its effect in the pews, and there's been debates, generally cordial, but sometimes not, and so we've got to address it and look at it to see what the Lord says in His Word. I'm also aware that there are several local churches that so avoid discussion of the sovereignty of God that their people don't even know what their position is, so they debate among themselves, and they're not helped in the matter, and it should not be this way. Your people should know the position of your church. During the candidating process, when I was coming here and I interviewed with the elders, I noted that on the website they had a doctrinal statement, you've all seen it, uh, especially if you're members here, which was basically the same doctrine that I was trained in and that I believe and that I wanted to teach, and I was so thankful because it meant I would not have to bite my tongue anything, and I'm thankful for the elders' sake as well because... 
Of course, it would be very difficult for them if I taught things that were different from the statement of faith in our church. And so it worked great that we could come together, my conscience could be clear, and I can teach what God's Word teaches. Now, in Christian thought and practice, we have 2,000 years of church history. And church history is instructive for us, showing us that every possible perspective on every subject the Bible addresses has been taught already, and the church over time has confirmed or condemned different perspectives. As heresies arose, church councils gathered and wrote letters to churches and pronouncements stating which errors had begun to infect congregations and why those errors must be biblically rejected. Church historian Nathan Busnitz has commented that through church history, the most serious problems have concerned either Christology or soteriology. In other words, they've either concerned the person of Christ or they've concerned how we're saved. If you look at even modern heresies, you look at Mormonism, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, or any of these different things, the perspective on how God brings people to himself are based in those things. They are based on a false representation of Christ and a false representation of how God works in salvation. Even the errors that are underlying beliefs like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness emerged in the first few centuries after the New Testament was written, and they were soundly condemned. So we don't even have to come up with new arguments against the modern heresies because their earlier form has already been perfectly well refuted. The truth has been well established. For 2,000 years, there have been two basic positions on the sovereignty of God in salvation. Since the time of the Protestant Reformation, these have taken the popular names of Calvinism and Arminianism, but those names are only relevant because they're the modern forms of the ancient debate. Once you understand this, you will actually be able to trace their thought through, back through church history. Going back centuries earlier, you will find Augustine taking the position of the sovereignty of God in salvation. His view is what we would call the God-centered view, and then we see also Pelagius taking the position of man's free will being determinative in salvation and his view being the man-centered view. So Augustus, Augustine and Pelagius were the two opposing views. Now in the case of Pelagius, you really want to understand what he taught if you want to understand modern errors. Because Pelagius' teaching explains much of what later transpired with the Roman Catholic Church and after the Reformation with Arminianism. Pelagius centered salvation on man's total free will, attempting to demonstrate that man was able to overcome on his own his sin and rebellion through that, the strength of that will. In order to do this, by the way, he denied original sin. This is critical to this debate. Original sin is so basic to Christianity that without it, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden makes little sense. It is precisely because of the sin against God by the first man, Adam, to take the forbidden fruit and plunge humanity into corruption that we need a Savior at all. We have inherited that original sin. The Bible says it this way, through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin came in through one man, and all of us have followed after him in the same pattern. Also, Romans 5, 18, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. If there's a better way to say it, I don't know how to say any better that one man sinned and all men inherited that sin. The Bible is so clear. 1 Corinthians 15 21 and 22, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead, for is in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. It cannot be any clearer than how the New Testament makes it that Adam sinned and that extended to all humanity. We have all inherited original guilt and the evidence of that is that we continue in our sinfulness. None of you doubt that you sin, right? I hope not. And certainly, I I know this, none of you doubt your neighbor sins, or your brother, or your sister, or your mother, or your father. You, You know we're sinners. 
Our nature from birth is that we sin. Pelagius also believed that the will of man was effectively neutral. Okay, so we're, we're going into the history of the debate, and all of this part of it is important. Pelagius believed the will of man was neutral. If there is no inherited guilt of humanity, then the will is neither evil nor guilt, or nor, uh, neither evil nor good. It is a tabula rasa. It's a blank slate. So you're just completely neutral coming into the world as an innocent child. This is the Pelagian view. Therefore, you can act in response to God with no preconceptions, no biases, no leanings apart from what the person's will determines. But this is so far off from what the Bible teaches, it's difficult to know how Pelagius could have thought this. And so, Pelagius was rightly, roundly, soundly condemned by the ancient church. They called him a heretic. Now, why did they need to do so? Because his view of redemption led to a works-based salvation, a contradiction of biblical truth, and ultimately to damnation of those who believed that lie, that they had good in themselves, that they could work for their salvation. R.C. Sproul says this, though Pelagius was condemned as a heretic by Rome, and he's talking about ancient Rome before it became the heretical center of Roman Catholicism, and its modified form, semi-Pelagian also was likewise condemned by the Council of Orange in the year 529. So he says, though Pelagius was condemned, the basic assumptions of this view persisted throughout church history to reappear in medieval Catholicism, Renaissance humanism, Socinianism, Arminianism, and modern liberalism. The seminal thought of Pelagius survives today not as a trace or tangential influence, but is pervasive in the modern church. Indeed, the modern church is held captive to it. How? Because the modern church believes that man is far more powerful, capable, and sinless than he is. Ideas compatible with Pelagianism are that man has a spark of goodness in him. And that is that he's not ultimately worthy of separation from the Lord in a place called hell. Pelagius believed that we have absolute freedom of the will. Now, Roman Catholicism actually rejected the full form of Pelagianism, but still embraced what we would call semi-Pelagianism. This is where there's still a recognition of original sin. Doctrinally, the Catholic Church holds to that. But unfortunately, it also holds a belief that man can and must add works to his faith in order to be saved. Now, I don't need to convince you of this. If you're an evangelical Christian today, if you believe the Bible, you know that Rome teaches faith plus works. Where did that come from? It came from this free will discussion from Pelagius and from those early ideas that twisted and contorted the doctrines of the Bible in the early church. That's got to be part of your understanding if you want to rightly examine these things. Unfortunately, the belief that you can add works to your faith is a damning belief. Now, by the time we get to the 1500s, so the 16th century theological development that we see there, we find both Calvin and Arminius arguing similar themes, the total free will of man and the absolute sovereignty of God, although I would say that Arminius was much more tempered than Pelagius was. So when I talk about these, these ideas of the reform view and the Arminian view, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ if we both believe that God saved us by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He has, he has nailed our sins to the cross. If we believe in Him, if we trust Him, we put our whole faith in Him, we will be saved. And so we're going to make sure that we address the modern form and not just the ancient. But it's helpful as you're determining where do I stand on what the Bible teaches about these things to know the history of it all. And so at the outset, as we study this, I want you to settle in your heart not to disparage one another over this doctrine. If you hold a slightly more Arminian view and someone else holds a slightly more Reformed view, consider each other, if you're both trusting Christ, to be brothers and sisters, 
and have a healthy and wholesome discussion. Robert Godfrey says this, it is certainly true that the theological differences between Calvinists and Arminians should not be overemphasized. Most Arminians have been and are evangelical Christians, but the differences between Calvinists and Arminians are important precisely for the work that all want to do for Christ. What is the work that needs to be done and how will it be done? The answers to those questions depend very much on whether man has a free will or not. Does one seek to entertain and move the emotions and will of men whose salvation is ultimately in their own hands? Or does one present the claims of God as clearly as possible while recognizing that the ultimate fruit comes only from the Holy Spirit? Those kinds of concerns will affect the ways in which Christians worship and witness and serve and live. And I think we have no greater example of this than the chaotic forms of modern Christianity that we see today with stadiums filled with charlatans who do all kinds of theatrics and all kinds of entertainment designed to manipulate the person to trust Christ. Whereas if you have the old the preachers of old, what you understand is they preach the Word of God, they exposit the Scriptures, and they depend wholly on the Holy Spirit to do His work among them. I have heard, though, men slander brothers for being heretics because they take different opinions. And so we want to avoid the extremities here of these views. I think it will cure you if we look through Ephesians of some false perspectives on the question of the will of man versus the will of God. And I think, I hope, I pray that you will actually find great comfort in the sovereignty of God. But before we do so, I want to just share personally how I came into a more reformed understanding of the doctrines that we're talking about here, the sovereignty of God and salvation. A number of years after I was saved, I began to, actually other friends of mine began to share with me messages from faithful Bible expositors, many of them you would know, and what they were teaching on were themes like the holiness of God. And the scriptures that were brought out drove me to see that God is far more holy than I had ever understood Him to be before. I felt like I was at the, the Mount of Sinai at the, at the surface there, staring at that mountain, understanding if I touch the mountain, I will die. God is holy, and I am a sinner. I'm a man of unclean lips. This is the kind of understanding I began to see that's in the Bible, but it began to be preached boldly and clearly. Well, as I began to listen to men like Paul Washer and John MacArthur and John Piper and some of these other ones that you know, it really basically took me into a a new perspective and helped me to understand I had been thinking lightly upon God, even though I was a Christian and I went to church regularly and I was beginning to raise my children in these things, in the truth of Scripture and the gospel, I had not really seen that God not only wants most of my life, He wants all of me. He wants me completely surrendered to His will. But as I began to study these things, I was looking around on the internet and trying to study more And I found people would make disparaging comments of some of these men and say things like, oh, did you know that Paul Washer is a Calvinist? And I thought to myself, oh, no, what am I what am I getting myself into? Because I have been taught that, you know, these reformed doctrines are scary doctrines. And, you know, there were books that were written like the dark side of Calvinism and everything that I had been taught was to be very leery of those kinds of things. And so I thought, maybe I need to just not get into this teaching as much. But then I thought, wait a second. I've never had any other teaching before that has driven me so much to my knees, driven me to prayer, driven me, driven me to confess my sin, driven me to seek the face of God than these things. So what is it about this? And it drove, put me on a path to determining what's the truth of these things. I don't care what any of these men say, I want to know what the Bible says and if it's true. I think the way they exposited Scripture seemed right, but let me examine this. And I can tell you over several years, Tanya and I began to do this together. And I remember actually in Ephesians 1 in particular, we were studying that and Tanya was underlining and circling all the terms that reference something of the sovereign nature of God. And that's what it took for her and 
All of that is what it took for me to be able to land and say, you know what, the Bible teaches a God who is not 99% sovereign and you're 1% uh, sovereign. He's 100% sovereign. And we have 100% responsibility at the same time. So we want to avoid the caricatures also that teach things like if you believe in the sovereignty of God, you're not going to evangelize or you're not going to go to the mission field. We absolutely must evangelize, and I must call you to repentance. If I'm a faithful preacher, I'm going to say, when you hear the Word of God, you must respond. You have a duty to respond, and you will be held accountable to, be, to respond. Now, how we balance those things, we don't. God does. The Holy Spirit does. We must be faithful to declare the truth and leave that to Him to accomplish. But the Reformed view takes the Scriptures that speak plainly of God's sovereignty and election at face value without qualification. This is something that I've learned over time. There is a different interpretive method, a different hermeneutic between the Reformed position and the Arminian position. The Reformed position looks at scriptures that talk of the sovereignty of God and take them unqualified as God being completely sovereign. And we also look at scriptures that talk of the responsibility of man as unqualified, you must respond, you must repent, you must believe, and so forth. But the Arminian view tends to take scriptures concerning man's responsibility, taking them without qualification, but taking passages related to God's sovereignty and salvation by qualifying them. What do I mean? What I mean is you will find teachers that hate the sovereignty of God and salvation saying things like this, predestination does not mean what you think it means. Election does not mean what you think it means. Chosenness does not mean what you think it means. Foreknowledge does not mean what you think it means. These are all biblical terms, and they will redefine them according to their understanding of how man has a free will that is unbound. Uh, on, for one example there, too, foreknowledge, by the way, does not mean looking down through the quarters of time to see what you would do and if you would believe and thereby determining whether you would be chosen. For knowledge in the Greek literally means for love. If God has foreknowledge of you, it is a for loving knowledge of you. But turn with me to Ephesians 1 because Ephesians 1 is going to help us greatly. We're going to read from verse 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, To the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to the kind intention which He purposed in Him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory, In Him also you, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, as I say, we're going to look at Ephesians 2, but I want to launch off of Ephesians 1. It sets the stage here. Let's look at the terminology of what God has done in this chapter. I think my batteries are about to go out if there's a replacement set. So let's look at the, tech, the terminology, chapter, and then we'll see chapter 2's description of salvation. Verse 1, Paul says he is an apostle by whose will? 
by God's will. Now, does that mean that Paul didn't also will to be an apostle? Well, I'm sure afterward he did. But he says, I am here primarily because of the will of God. And he, he addresses the saints who are faithful. That is, who are presently, actively engaged in faithful living before the Lord. They are trusting Christ. They are believing Christ. They are turning from sin. They are making their way down the narrow, winding path toward the Lord Himself. Verse 2, grace and peace, where is its source? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God being referenced as Father means that all good things come from Him, the Father of lights. And the reference of Jesus Christ as Lord reminds us that Jesus is over all. He's over the government. He's over the church. He's over the family. He's over the nations. He's over the world. He's over the universe. When we were dealing with many issues of government overreach in the last few years, what was our refrain? Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And in the ancient church, what did they say when Caesar said, you must bow to me, you must offer, even if you're in a different province of the Roman Empire, you must offer a pinch of incense to the Caesar. What was the response of the ancient church? No, but Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a sovereign term, a term of the Lord Jesus Christ's sovereignty. Verse 3, He blessed us. The source of our blessing is from Him. Verse 4, He chose us in Him. That is, the Father chose us, His people, in Christ before the foundation of the world. Order of operations here is so important. When you're in school, you learn an order of operations for math. And what happens if you get that order wrong? It does not even calculate according to truth. You have to get your order right. In the scripture, over and over again, it talks about God being the first mover in every circumstance, in creation and in new creation. It is not that he is determining what to do based on what you would eventually do. It says there, he chose us in him before the foundation of wor- the world. Keep that order of operations in mind, and as you read through Scripture, you will see it's much easier to discern these things. Verse 5, He predestined, that is, He set in advance where we would, wh- what we would end up as being. He predestined us to our adoption. And it says even there, by whose will? By His will. Verse 6, He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. He freely. We always want to remember that salvation is a free gift. If it's by grace, it's a gift. If it's by works, it is not a gift. It is earned. Salvation is freely bestowed on us. Verse 7, Our redemption, which was costly, resulted in forgiveness because of His riches. It's out of the treasure houses of heaven that God has given us our redemption, our forgiveness. And so, verse 8, we have had all good things lavished on us. That is given to us. Again, by grace, He has given us. Verse 9, what, what do we see there? His will, His intention, His purpose. I don't know how many ways the Bible can say this to our hearts that are resisting these kinds of ideas, but everywhere through Scripture we see this. His will, His intention, His purpose. In fact, even if you look up the will of man, you'll find places like John 1 where it will say, not by the will of man, but what? But God. Scripture directly tells us God is sovereign. Verse 10, the goal of all things is what? The goal of all things is a summing up in Christ. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So even in his sovereign working before time, in time, while you're alive, Until the end and through that final day, we will all be to the praise of the glory of Christ. Verse 11, He predestined by His purpose, His will. Another way to say that is His counsel. Verse 12, 
Here's another so that, so that we would be what? To the praise of His glory. Verse 13 shows that it is the gospel preached and then heard, which is a passive thing on our part, and then believed, that's active on our part, and then we're sealed by the Spirit, that's passive. Verse 14, so that we would again be to the praise of His glory. So you see just a few sovereignty terms there, don't you? And how many terms there do you see where it's man is sovereign? None. You, what you see is God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. But His responsibility is not a sovereign responsibility. He is not a master of His domain. He is subject to Christ. From that, let's launch into Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 says this, and we're going to read through to verse 10. This is our condition, and this is what the Lord did. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In this passage, we see features of our sovereign salvation. We see first, ultimate inability, ultimate inability. Second, we see ultimate life. This is what we are called to. This is what we are given, ultimate life. And third, we see ultimate motivation. What is our ultimate motivation? And we're going to look at that. First, let's look at ultimate inability. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies in modern or postmodern trends to evangelism is to fall into the ditches beside the biblical way. When you proclaim Christ, you are not telling someone that they have it in them to believe. You are not telling them that there's a God-shaped hole in their heart and you've got the plug to fill it. You're not declaring that you've got a divine scratcher for their itch. You and I proclaim a far more impossible message. You are taking the Word of God which says to them, repent, and telling a corpse to come alive. From an earthly perspective, nothing of the biblical method of our witness makes sense. And if it weren't for the fact that sinners dead in their trespasses do believe and are reborn, you might be tempted to think that it's absurd. But we don't even do what we do because it works. We're not looking for numbers. We don't count souls one as though we could make a list of spiritual realities only God knows. Rather, we do what we do and we believe what we believe and we preach what we preach simply because the Scripture commands us to do this. I don't know what the results are going to be. I don't know who here is going to hear the gospel today and is going to believe or is going to reject it or is going to be encouraged. That's not my work. That's the Holy Spirit's work. What you see in modern evangelicalism too often today is people who think that they can drum up the emotion and the motivation to get people's arms twisted into believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it was Rick Warren who said one time, give me somebody for five minutes and I'll be able to convince them of the gospel. No, you can't. No, you can't. I can't arm wrestle somebody into the kingdom and neither can you. Nobody can do that. Only God is able to do that work. We are talking about going from death 
to life. You and I can no more tell Lazarus to come out of the tomb than we can tell somebody, I can make you come alive in Christ. But we have a message that we preach where we can, with authority, with the authority of Scripture and the Holy Spirit, tell anyone, if you come to Christ and believe on Him, you will have salvation. You will be saved. And so there's got to be a proper understanding of how we are to act. People will say, well, that sounds depressing if we can't know. I mean, at least a motivational speaker can kind of get people riled up and excited and there's a call back from the audience and they can know if they're having a, a kind of an impact. But helping people have better finances or follow their dreams, knowing that they will still perish, that, brothers and sisters, is truly depressing. Preaching the word of God and proclaiming the mercy of Christ who died for the sins of his people, that can never be depressing. In fact, it's not only not depressing, it's glorious. The fact that I can stand here and tell you Jesus saves is amazing. I could do it all day long. I really could. We have two services. We'll, we'll add more if we need to. As long as you keep coming, I'm going to keep preaching. But even though we do not preach for numbers, people actually do believe. They come to new life. They are reborn. The difference between a message of manipulation and arm twisting and gospel proclamation is the difference between offering somebody a sinking raft on its way to hell and pointing to the narrow way and the narrow gate that leads to life and Christ and the riches of heaven. Critics of the evangelical world will often say, well, you preach the Bible, but you're not concerned about feeding someone that's hungry, which, of course, is completely untrue. And since we're talking about church history today, all you have to do is study a little bit of church history to know that all the hospitals, all the schools, all of those things were derived from biblical principles. Why do we teach anything? Because knowledge can be known. Why do we teach about the laws of the universe? Because we know the lawgiver. The pagans didn't do those things. They taught such mystical things in such strange ways that even their own people can't interpret them. Only the Christian has a hope that goes beyond anything else, and certainly it goes to the poor and destitute, the orphan, the widow. There is no one who more values the soul of a human being, meaning the whole person, their spirit, their body, than the Christian. We know that each one was made in God's image. Verse 1 tells us you were genuinely, legitimately dead in your trespasses and sins. And that is summarized in verses 2 and 3. Now what does it mean that we were dead? The Lunida Greek Dictionary puts it this way, being unable to respond to any impulse or to perform some function, unable, ineffective, dead, powerless. Is that what a dead person in the ground is? Yes, that, that describes them. Is that what a spiritually dead person is? Yes, friends, that is what a spiritually dead person is. They are unable to do anything on themselves. They are like Lazarus waiting for someone else to move. That speaks there, that Greek word, of ultimate inability. There was nothing in you that could simply be turned on like you were just waiting for God and you desired Him, but you just needed somebody to sort of help you a little bit. No. Many of you know that there was a teaching that came along after Christ had risen from the dead. And today even some skeptics will say, Jesus, certainly there's so much evidence that he was alive after he went to the cross. He must not have really died. But if you study the resurrection at all, you know that he went from having apostles and disciples who doubted to those who went to the ends of the earth and were martyred for him because they saw him truly dead and truly alive three days later. It is the Roman soldiers who were the expert executioners. They knew how to bring someone to death. They did not know how to make someone alive, but God did. And God raised up His Son. 
and the Son Himself is alive today. But of course, you know, the swoon theory, as they call it, is ridiculous because you're not going to convince anyone you're the Savior if you're half dead and bludgeoned from nails in your hands and feet and a spear in your side and your heart. This is part of it is the picture of a limping Christ saying, you know, like, I've, I've risen, but he's actually just really damaged and wounded. You're not going to convince people that you're a Savior. But it wasn't like that. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was miraculous precisely because He had actually died and His body was actually in the grave three days. It would be crazy to think that Jesus had not really been killed. And it would be crazy to think that you were not actually spiritually dead in your sins. Scripture gives you your own autopsy here. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world. You walked according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit, now at work in the sons of disobedience, which is to say, Satan, God's arch enemy, led the way for you. The body of your sin was so corrupt that you followed the enemy of the Lord and did Satan's bidding. We don't really think of ourselves that way too often, do we? Even as Christians, we often do not recognize the evil in our hearts before Christ. I think actually often if you're raised in the church, this is worse because you were not really enabled to go off into the world and to sin the way that you can. And so you don't necessarily understand your deadness before knowing Christ. Now, it's okay if you don't know when you were saved as a believer raised in a Christian environment. But what you do have to know is that whenever it was that the Lord saved you, He truly brought you from death to life. Okay, that's so critical for understanding. In fact, for telling your testimony, you want to be able to say to people that, just as Colossians 1 tells us, we were transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's Son. Now, we often think of ourselves you know, I'm not just going to reject God and follow Satan. We, we, we don't really think that we're so bad. We don't really look at ourselves that way. But I think we have to be clear with ourselves. We, be, we have to be honest with ourselves what we were before salvation. Even as I shared with you that when I began to listen to preachers that taught on the holiness of God, I began to see what? My, my own sinfulness And not only my own sinfulness before Christ, but my understanding that I now have to war with sin daily because sin is at work in me. Christ has freed me from the power of sin. He's freed me from the penalty of sin. But as you've heard many good theologians say, we're freed from the penalty, we're freed from the power in this life. Eventually, we will be freed from the presence of sin, but not yet. That comes at the very end. Right now, There is still a presence of sin, and we war against it. Well, verse 3 in Ephesians 2, "...among them them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." That's the verdict. Now, you might say, well, I was just going with the flow. And that might be true, but that doesn't get you off the hook. The Nazis at the end of World War II... We're not able to say, I was just going with the flow of the Third Reich. No, they were, they, they were marked out as guilty in courts of justice and executed for their crimes. And so it is with us. We cannot blame our sin on our circumstances. We can't blame our sin on our friends. We can't blame it on anyone else. We are culpable. We are guilty. We need a Savior. Everyone who just goes with the flow is a child of wrath, as we all were. Jesus said of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 11, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Don't let anyone tell you 
that those who believe in the sovereignty of God do not believe in the responsibility of man. We believe it is only by faith that anyone is saved. Those dead in their sins cannot please him. You might think that prior to Christ you were just ready to be awakened. But this inability, Ephesians 2 demonstrates, shows that even if someone tried, we would be dead as a light bulb, not really able to, like a burnt out filament, not being able to be flipped on just like that. We needed a new heart. And that's why we need to be careful about our approach to gospel proclamation. The sinner needs rebirth, not just to be awakened. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, John 3.5. You must be born again, John 3.8. And that's the great dilemma. How does one dead yet live? Many will say, look, I'm not that bad. I love my family. I'm a good person. I don't lie or steal. But friends, the evidence that you've done worse than you think is that you are now dying. I don't care how young you are or how healthy. You and I know that we only have so much time before death comes for us or the Lord returns. Whether by car crash or from disease or illness or just from the gradual decay of our organs as we age. But why do we die? Romans six twenty three, For the wages of sin is death. We have earned death. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. I would really encourage all of you as you give your testimony to others, and you really should be in the practice of telling your testimony to others. Don't begin your testimony with, I was searching for God. Because you know what that verse says? There is none who seeks for God. Either our perspective is true or God's perspective is true. You may have been in a place, in fact I was, where I came to be seeking God, but as I look back after salvation, I realize God was at work a long time before I began to seek for God. And so by the time that I was seeking for God, it wasn't really me seeking because I had it in me, this spark of goodness or anything like that, God's word had already been having its effect on me. And even my, my um, lostness had already been having its effect because the Holy Spirit was kind to show me the emptiness and the lostness of my way. But next time someone doesn't think they're so bad, show them Romans 3. There is our inability. The only reason you or I die is because we have in ourselves the sentence of death, and that has meant both physical death, which takes place in a heartbeat, and spiritual death, which is eternal. And praise God that He lets us see the reality of physical death. We had a funeral last week, and it's always a a tragedy, a, a death of a child in particular. It's something that is very difficult for the church. But what we do is we, we praise God for the little one and we also thank God that He reminds us life is precious, life is short, for some shorter than others. All of that is His kindness. And it's His kindness to unbelievers as much as to believers. Because the unbeliever forgets about death even though God has set eternity on their heart. And when there's a funeral, there's a memorial, there's a graveside, people are awakened to the fact They are frail, and one day they will meet their maker. But some of you hearing this could despair. What if I'm headed for hell? What if I know I'm not right with God? What can be done? Look next at uh, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, God has such a great love that He will save His people from any sin. A lot of people even think they've sort of out-sinned the Savior. They think, I've done too much, I can't come to Christ. No, this, this doesn't qualify 
how bad you've been or how many sins you've had, God is able to save. And the response then must be, if that's true, that's what I desire, Lord, be merciful to me. I see, I read there in verse 4 that you're rich in mercy. God, pour out your mercy on me. Rich in mercy. This is amazing. If your theology includes only God's love, it is an incomplete picture of who He is. God is love, yes, but He is also holy. Or if your theology includes only God's wrath, it is an incomplete picture. God is holy, yes, but He is also love. And if your theology of God does not hold that God is merciful, even rich in mercy, it is a totally insufficient view that you hold to. Listen, God must judge sin because He is just. He must love the righteous because He is just. So He loves His people who He saved and made righteous. He will not let the unrighteous off the hook and He will not punish the innocent. But the problem for you and me is that we are not innocent. We are unjust. We are deserving of God's wrath. So how can God be just and punish our sin and also treat us as righteous and innocent, deserving of His love? And the answer is found in the operation of the mercy of His grace. Our sins must be punished. And brothers and sisters, our sins were punished already at the cross. God's mercy is not to say simply to the criminal, I forgive you. How would that provide justice to those wronged, most notably God Himself, whom we have greatly offended? That is impossible. God must punish sin, for the Lord will not leave Him unpunished who takes His name in vain. And really, in some sense, anyone who breaks any of the commandments takes the name of God in vain because you all and I were made in God's image. And when we sin, it is bearing false witness to who God is. We are, a, we are being an unfaithful image bearer. God will judge every crime. You were guilty as sin and dead in it. You were without any kind of hope, but God intervened. You were unlovely, but God loved you. You were unmerciful, but God showed you mercy. You were dead, but God brought you to life. You were at enmity with God. And that old and important phrase means that you hated Him. But God poured out His his wrath not on you, but on one who bore your sins for you. You were hostile, but God was kind. You were evil, but God was good. You were unrighteous, but God was righteous. You were truly without hope in this cursed world, but God made you an heir of the new heavens and the new earth. But listen to this carefully. He did not do it by letting you off the hook. He did so by placing every sin you ever committed onto the shoulders of Christ who atoned for our sin. He made us alive together with Christ. What does this mean except that the life that Christ lives is the life that is given to us to live before God in heaven and to serve Him forever? And that phrase, by grace you have been saved, it will be picked up again at verse 8 to reinforce that is all according to His mercy, His kindness that you've been saved, that you've been made right with God. Now what does it mean that He raised us up with Him and He seated us in the heavenly places in Christ. Romans 5 tells us that sin and death came through Adam and the head of sinful humanity, as the head of sinful humanity. We were all in Adam. In as much as we are all genetic descendants of Adam, we are all in him. He is our head in that sense. But that righteousness and life that we now have came through Jesus Christ, the head of redeemed humanity. That's why the Bible says all in Christ are considered this way. And you have to understand if you're to rightly marvel at the goodness and kindness and love of God toward you, in Adam you sinned. And in Adam you died. Ephesians 2 says you were dead in your sins just like Adam. But it doesn't stop there. God sent His Son given as head of all things to the church. And as in Adam we all sinned, so too in Christ our new head we were made alive 
As Christ our head was killed for our transgressions, in Him we died. Because we have that union with Him, it is a permanent and eternal union. And so it extends even backwards to His death on the cross. As He died, He died literally as a substitute for His people. His people were in Him in a theological sense, dying on the cross. As Christ our head was killed for our transgressions, we died. And as Christ conquered sin and death, in Him we conquered. In Him, all that was against us has been defeated. And as Christ our head has ascended to the throne in heaven, at the Father's right hand, Christ representing all the hosts of the redeemed, we are all in Him raised there. This is not figurative as though it just means God considers us to be raised with Christ. Inasmuch as we are in Christ and Christ is in God, we were raised with Him. We're declared to be forgiven on the basis of us having died to sin because Christ died to sin. If that's not true, you're not saved. If that's not true, you're not forgiven. If that's not true, you will die in your sins. It must be that you are united with Christ or you are separated from Christ. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. That's how important it is that Christ rose from the grave. His death is our death to to sin. His resurrection is our resurrection to new life. But unlike what happened in Adam, resulting in great suffering and condemnation, turn to Romans 5 for a moment. Romans 5 gives us this great picture. From verse 17, For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. That is so important. This is the reality for all who believe. But you must believe. You must repent of your sins. God will not pardon the sinner who will not forsake their sins. You can't even just say, I go to church and I believe and I say that I believe, but you're living in sin. You are not a Christian if you can perpetually live in your sin and live out your sin and not repent of it and not come to Christ. The truth is that a Christian is always repenting. We repent once and finally in the sense that we are saved at the beginning, forgiven of all sin, but when we sin again, We are by character, by nature now, as those who honor Christ, repenting of sin to Him who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We don't just hold on to our sin. We repent of it. But many people will hold on to it and delay and delay and delay. You can often lose even a measure of your assurance when you're living in sin. If there's anybody here who's not sure, I'm not sure if I'm saved because of my lifestyle. I can tell you, and this has been borne out through church history also, when Christians live in sin, they lose at least often for a time their assurance because they don't have the comfort of their salvation. What did David say in verse 12 of Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. He sinned with Bathsheba and the response in the end was he repented. He knew that even though he already was a believer, already a servant of the Lord, he had sinned again after salvation. He had to repent again. All who are Christ must repent when they sin. And we often lose our joy when we are not walking with the Lord. The Lord has called us to obey His Word. He has told us that my people are those who obey my Word. If you love me, you will keep my Word. Romans 5 again has called salvation a free gift. Philippians 1 tells us that even the faith by which we receive our justification is a free gift. Turn with me, in fact, to Philippians 
I want you to see this with your own eyes, because even as I showed you in chapter 1 of Ephesians, you're looking through there, you're seeing all these terms of sovereignty, all that God has done, and that there must be a response from us to that salvation. And I, as a proclaimer of the gospel, must call you to repentance and to faith. But did you know that even your believing is a gift from God? Look at Philippians. He's talking to them about suffering. And at the end of the chapter, chapter 1, he's trying to help them understand their suffering. And he says this, verse 29, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. He is writing from a prison cell and he's saying, I'm suffering, you're suffering with me, you're also suffering persecution. And I want you to know that suffering is a gift. And the way he says it is, it has been granted not only to believe but to suffer. In other words, believing has been granted to you, believing has been given to you. What does that mean? That means that salvation, dear friends, is of the Lord to quote Spurgeon, when Spurgeon has been asked, what do you mean of the sovereignty of God and salvation? He says, I only mean this, salvation is of the Lord. If you're a Christian today, it's because of God. It's but God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God. That's the joy that we can know is that even as we believe, we feel ourselves to believe, we feel ourselves to be responsible in that belief, we feel ourselves to be exerting belief, we even feel at times when we're down, I'm going to make a choice, a conscious choice to honor Christ today even though I don't feel like it. When we do that, we feel ourselves to be exerting faith and so we often wrongly interpret it to say that faith is generated from within me. No, it is not. Scripture says faith also is a gift. It's a free gift. All of that comes to you through the sovereign work of God. The sovereignty of God in salvation we see over and over again. But do not despise that God has chosen you for salvation. Rather, take comfort because what has been given by God in salvation is eternal and cannot be taken away. You see, if I could arm wrestle you into the kingdom, if I could manipulate your emotions so that you might believe, I could also manipulate your emotions or someone else could to get you to no longer believe. If you can be convinced by pure logic and reason to believe in Christ, you can be convinced by pure logic and reason to disobey Christ and to forsake Him. No, brothers and sisters, salvation is of the Lord and it is secure in the Lord. Thomas Watson said this, justification is a fixed, permanent thing. It can never be lost. The Arminians hold an apostasy from justification. Today, justified. Tomorrow, unjustified. Today, a Peter. Tomorrow, a Judas. Today, a member of Christ. Tomorrow, a limb of Satan. Brothers and sisters, may it never be. That isn't our Lord. Our Lord did not bring you to the glories of salvation only to disappoint you down the road. He brought you to Himself to save you surely. The Lord will secure us for heaven. He has. It is not dependent on our will today because it was not dependent on our will in the beginning. How can we look at what Christ has done and not desire to know Him? And let's be real. How can we not desire to do everything for Him? He has supplied all our need. He's supplied everything to us. And that brings us to our final point. We looked at ultimate inability. We've looked at our ultimate life in Christ. He has redeemed us. And we read from verse 8 on of Ephesians. Turn back there. Here I am flipping and I've actually got a ribbon in my place. Ephesians 2 from verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. What heights of grace we find in such statements. 
This passage of Scripture is one of the most glorious for its clarity on grace. And you'll notice three essential parts of these verses. The grace of God, the work of God, and the purpose of God. In the grace of God, the first thing to notice is the phrase it all hangs on, by grace. And I want you to understand how wonderful grace is. And it's really informed by what you've just read. Grace is getting what we did not earn for ourselves. And in the context of our rebellion and the evil within our own hearts, it is a merciful extension of God's help for the poor sinner. See, we earned for ourselves what? Death. But He has earned for ourselves life. All that we had earned for ourselves is what we read from Romans 6.23. Our wages were death, but God being rich in His mercy, this is our reality. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain, for me who Him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Christ pursued you all the way to His death. He died so that you might live. You earned for yourself the wrath of God and He stood in your place to receive that wrath And he received the sorrow that you and I should have received as none had ever known. And he received that death so that you might live. How then can you receive eternal life? By believing. Yes, by responding. If you hear of this offer of salvation, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on his name. It's all by faith. Faith is really how we receive the gift of God. It's, it's the hand that receives the good gift of God, the, the gift by His grace. Listen to John's word. Speaking of Christ, John says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, 4. Jesus gave us life in creation. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit made us. And beyond this, Jesus holds not only the life in our veins, but eternal life and light that we might behold the glory of God. What about the work of God? The next essential point is that we are His workmanship. And of course, I love how Ephesians 2.9 puts this, it is not by works. Now, even before getting to that, look at verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. That is not only talking about grace is a gift of God. It's saying that whole first part of the sentence, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, all of those things, both of those things, is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Again, the Bible tells you in so many plain ways, salvation is His gift to you. And we're His workmanship, referring to the fact that we were given eternal life by Him. He created us, He, he made us new creations, but our salvation came at a cost, And the cost was paid by Christ Himself. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this is where we we say, so then what? What do I do? How do I respond? Well, first we respond by believing. Repent of your sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus. You shall be saved. And then what? And then live for Him. Do the works that He has called you to. All of you here have been called to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and also, if you believe, to do the good works that He has prepared for you. And He even says there, all those things that you were prepared to do in your life, He prepared those good works for you before time began. That should comfort you. Whatever age you're at, you're living this life. You're trying to say, okay, how am I living my life, raising my family, doing what I do, living my, working my career, teaching, going to school? All of those things can be done in light of the view that God has said He's prepared good works for you to walk in Him, walk in them. All that you do now is for a very important purpose. But I believe, dear church, you will have no higher view of God and no lower view of man than the gospel of sovereign grace by which alone we are saved. If you believe in a sovereign God, one who has saved us truly and has secured us permanently, you will Keep that view of God high. You will worship Him and you'll respond with adoration. When Paul began to declare salvation for the Gentiles, 
He said in Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this, heard the gospel, they began rejoicing. In fact, heard he was telling them that salvation has been open to the Gentiles. Before, it was something where people thought only the Jews could believe. And they said, no, the door, Paul said, has been open to the Gentiles. And there it says, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Well, our Lord is one who is sovereign over all things. He kills and makes alive, 1 Samuel 2, 6. He declares the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. He is the beginning and the end, Revelation 21, 6. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, how sovereign is our God, our good God, our loving God, our gracious God, and our merciful God? Let's pray. Lord, we pray to you. In fact, we come to you only because we know you're sovereign. We know that you hear all things, you know all things, and so we can come to you because of that. Our prayers are answered because you're sovereign. Otherwise, we would never have answered prayer if you could not affect change, if you could not do what you will. And so we seek your help, Lord, because we are ministering in a world of darkness and we desire to see our lost neighbors and loved ones come to know you. We want to see them saved. We want to see them rejoice in their salvation. But only you can do that work. And so give us a new uh, zeal, Lord, to go before you in prayer, spending more time in prayer. It seems, Lord, that we pray less when we think you're less sovereign. When we think it's up to us, we will labor more in our own strength. But when we know that it's up to you, we will labor by your Spirit, praying all the way for your salvation to impact those around us. Help us as we understand the events of our lives. I know there are many here, even some today, that are suffering with various ailments. Lord God, I pray for healing for those we love, but I also pray for your nearness for them as they suffer. And we always pray in these things, not our will, but yours be done. We know that you delight to do good things for your children. You delight to give us the desires of our heart. And sometimes we come before you, Lord, and we're so burdened with things. And we have a desire that we think is a good desire. And ultimately, even by our prayer, you change our hearts and help us to understand maybe a different understanding of our circumstances and maybe even a different direction to pursue. But all of this is because we have a living relationship with you. We know that we're not just those like the deists who think that God set the earth in motion and stood back from it. We know that you are, as our sovereign God, intimately, intimately working in all of creation, and certainly you are near to your people. You're near to the brokenhearted, as the psalmist says. You're near to those who trust in you. You're near to those who are going through not only pain and suffering in physical circumstances, but they're also grieving in various ways, whether over their own sin or over the sin of others, whether over life circumstances, the situation with finances and life choices and all that goes on. Lord, you know our needs. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give us great wisdom through your word and through study of the scriptures, through fellowship with one another. And I pray as the weeks draw on in the summer also, we would rejoice to remember even the gift of the seasons is from you. All good things have come from our, our loving Heavenly Father. We thank you and praise you in the name of Christ. Amen.